Here at Rockingham Castle, you get a sense that this place was an icon of royal power dominating the landscape. I've been able to see how this place has transformed over the centuries. On the site of the original castle keep, there's now a rose garden, and just down below, outside the castle walls, sits the church. Join me as I dig into the illustrious history of this extraordinary castle. I'll be planting a rose on the site of the original Norman Castle Keep. We shall okay. remember that one. <laughs> we shall label it. I hope it survives. Julie's rose. <laughs> <laughs> Julie's rose. I really hope it survives. Yes. Exploring Montague family connections in the parish church, and I'll be meeting with Basil, the archivist here who has found a very special document connected to my husband's family home, Hinchingbrook. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as I do, please join me as I head off to visit some of Britain's most spectacular historic homes. Hello. Hello. I'm Julie. My name's Dean. I'm head Dean. gardener. Head gardener? Wow. <laughs> Amazing. I'm Lovely honored to meet, to meet you. Anytime I meet a head gardener, I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys are absolutely incredible. No, we'll get that far. So, wow. So, this is, here we are in the Rose Garden, which yes. I, my understanding is this is where the keep used to be. Is it right? is, yes. And if you look at the design of the garden, it's actually designed to look like a keep still with the, the U being the, um, the different entrances. And we also have box shaped U on the outside, which are the soldiers marching back to the keep. So we've ah. tried to keep that. So it's um, in keeping with what is original purpose. So this is the rose. These are all roses here. Yes. They are. It's a, a, a yeah, traditional formal rose garden, which uh, is not as common as it used to be, really. So. And so but, tell yeah. me what you're doing now. And are these, can I ask, because I know a, a tiny bit about roses. Are they new roses or old roses or a mixture they're a mixture well, they're a mixture they are old style hybrid tea roses which right. we don't really use that term anymore but these are the, the taller larger flowering varieties so, right yeah Brilliant. there is a mixture of all different things so I, I suspect it just must look absolutely spectacular it does and yes is it what is it end of june when when they're in full probably moon, would you say? yeah probably a little bit early in that here because we are quite sheltered with the the u hedge all the way around so we have a, quite a long season of roses right so, yeah and that's brilliant it's, and, um, my observations from talking to people that have come is that it's a very romantic garden and obviously there's nothing more romantic than roses and you know when you're working <laughs> in here it's really nice because you do see couples and they're often taking pictures of each other with the roses and things like that. So it's lovely sniffing the roses and all those sorts of things. That's so lovely. So that's really nice. And we've got obviously the fantastic views and everything. Yeah. So yeah, it's, no, it's a absolutely. romantic type garden. Absolutely. Okay, so you've done a lot of planting right now. These are all new roses. No, not, no. All, not all of them are new. A lot of it, it's, we're in rotation. So we're rotating a lot of the older roses yeah. out. They've done their job and you know, it's time for them to have a rest as yes. it were. And then, um, but we've got to plant lots of new roses, uh, over 200, um, oh. to get the garden back into to where it needs to be. Um, but the problem is, is that roses don't like being where roses were before. So rose replant disease is a real problem ah. for a garden like this. And um, the old method, I mean, scientifically, we don't exactly know what causes it. Even now, with all the scientific discoveries we've had, we're still not exactly sure why roses fail. I mean, there's lots of pathogens and different things in the yes. soil, but, um, and so, you know, there's various methods of, of getting over that, 
But the main method that people have been using for years and years is the one where they take out all the soil and then replace that all with fresh soil and take all the old soil away. And the, the problem with that is it's not only you know, back breaking, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of cost, but also it's not very ecologically sound no. either. Uh, and so what we're doing and hopefully successfully is doing a slightly different method, whereas we're planting them in recycled cardboard pots. So you're gonna actually, <laughs> you're gonna put in the cardboard? Yes. With it? Yeah, that's Wait. right. So it's- I've never heard, is this something new? No, no. it's not, it's no. not new. As anything in gardening, there's no, no, no such thing as a new idea. Oh, right. <laughs> but um, mostly it would be something I would recommend somebody to do if they were doing one in a border. Okay. But it's not very often you do 200 of them, but- um, but yeah, you're so try this, it out. this is going to try it out. You're yeah. Try it out. So the idea would be is this little self-contained environment. It's got compost in there, and it will, its roots will grow. And the first year, we'll take very good care of it, and its roots will grow. And as the water penetrates into the cardboard, that will break down into the soil, and then the first tentative roots will go out into the old soil. And yes. hopefully, because it's bigger and stronger by then, and we've taken care ah. of it, it will be able to withstand any attack just as the old roses do. Fantastic. But all the, all the cardboard as well, it's recycled from things that we brought in the summer, from the different packaging, so. Um, Brilliant. It's all good, in, and the compost is, we made here ourselves in the woods. So oh my gosh, okay, so yeah, yeah, so it's local and it's. Um, yeah, it's, well, that's recyclable. it. Recyclable, it's um, fantastic for the environment, mm -hmm. all of that, right? Hopefully, yeah, <laughs> and hopefully. I wouldn't say it was completely work free, but I right. think it's a lot less work than <laughs> digging them all out and replacing them yes. in a way. But what we want to do is make a round hole mm. and so we can drop it straight in. Ah, so, okay. So, yes, that's okay. why we've got, so we, what we've got here. Uh, spades that we normally use for digging post holes. Yes. So not, not your normal spade. No, 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 not at all. And then what we've got to do is measure how big the pot is yep. against the spade. Yep. And then go for that height. So we'll move this line out the way. Okay. So if I do this one mm -hmm. and drop her in, then you can have a go at the other one. Okay. So, oh, wonderful. Uh, okay. It's all part of the process. So what we want to do we want the edge of the pot, that's quite good actually, we want the edge of the pot to be just above, yeah. oh, just, just above, because we don't want too much of that old soil to go into yes. that. Okay. So, and then we just backfill. And then you backfill it. And basically, the other thing, there's no firming down, there's no stomping on, stomping it. on it, we're not going to move any roots, and basically we're going to let the weather do the job for us. Yeah. So Brilliant. what will happen there is that <gasps> the frost and the wind and all those things will go in and compact that soil, you know, firm it back round exactly. the pot. Exactly. And then we've got a lovely growing environment. The only thing I would say mm. is taking care of it is that you've got to remember until the cardboard breaks down, it's in a pot. So right. you've got to water it as if it's in a pot. Ah, yes. okay, so yes. So you've got to be careful so with got... the watering when it starts off. Right, so you've got to, okay. So where would you like me to make my mark? <laughs> So if you only go, they're about 18 inches apart. Okay. So quite close, but to, um, because it's a rose bed, you want it nice and full. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a go there, okay. and bearing in mind, you're trying to make a, a round okay. hole. Yeah, a round hole. A round there. hole, yes. Yeah. So you've got to be, yes, more um, straight down the sides. Okay, there's yeah. lovely uh, Rutland clay there for you. That's right, <laughs> exactly. Okay, I'm going to make this round hole. Oh, she'll <laughs> feel it once we've... Uh, done 200 of these. Yeah, I, is this <laughs> only your first two? <laughs> no, we, we've right. done a whole bed over there actually, so, uh, but I've got a very uh, good team as well, and they'll, they'll be uh, here helping yeah, me. Yeah, because I can already feel this in my back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I don't think I'd like to do it all on my own, no. No, do you, I, I'm gonna have to do some yoga after this for sure, <laughs> to stretch it out, and I've only done one, okay? But um, it's, uh, yeah, still, com Still better, I think, than uh, taking the entire two tons of soil away. I agree. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to just dig all that out. I think we're getting there now, you know. Okay, what do you think? I think we're there, yeah. I okay. Think we're there, yeah. So we'll uh, measure her up. The only other up, uh, thing as well you've got to be careful of is that uh, the pots don't get horrendously wet because yeah. then you haven't got a pot more than uh, a mush. Yeah, there we go. There we go. I think that's okay, because that one's quite deep in its pot, so. Yes. If you just backfill around that and. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna backfill Yeah, just around gently it. backfill around it and uh, push it back in and we're good to go. Okay, okay. Mm. Here we 
go. And hopefully you'll come back and uh, take pictures of them when they're all flowering and I wonderful. Will. We will absolutely <laughs> um, come back because, you know, this is, as you said, rose gardens just, everybody loves a rose garden. They do. Um, they just, Even, I mean, we have so, so many wonderful plants these days, but the, you know, there's something about the roses. mystique and romance of a rose that really, right. did really uh, people all right, what really do you think love. here, Dean? I think that's good, yes. I'm, think that, I'm, I'm happy, happy with that. that. Are you yeah. really happy with that? Yeah, I am. Yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah. okay. So uh, we shall okay. remember that one. <laughs> we shall label it. I hope it survives. Julie's Rose. Julie's <laughs> Rose. <laughs> I really hope it survives. Yes. Um, um, brilliant. But that. But listen, how fascinating um, to be able to do work like this that also is environmentally friendly. Hopefully, good for the soil. I think we all have to think that way now, you know, yes. and it's even even if you're working in ornamental gardens, you've still got to, you know, lessen the impact environmentally. And of course, we are growing things as well. So, you know, that's good for the yep. environment, yeah, everything, no, of course. everything that we grow. Um, but yeah, I mean, and also it's um, finding new ways to keep the landscape the same, you know, the, uh, you know, the old rose gardens are important. People love to visit them. And I think, you know, I'm very passionate about it, like keeping these rose gardens going and, and making yes. them, taking them into the, the uh, to a, a new age, basically, but also keeping that mystique and romance. So. Of course, of course. And making sure that people, when they come back to Rockingham, they can, you know, well, that's take right. their I'm, photo you know. um, embracing each other in front of <laughs> A rose here. Well, in we do. Garden. We do have people that have come here for years, and um, they've come back and they say, you know, we had our wedding here, or we had our wedding anniversary, and you know, they like to look at the roses and remember those yes, times. So, of yeah, course. It's oh, very good. brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you, Dean. This was incredibly educational. Thank you. And I am looking forward to coming back here and seeing um, how Julie's rose <laughs> yes. is blooming. How it's blooming. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. We should definitely uh, mark brilliant, it. Off. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, Dean, okay. so much. Thank Take you. care. Bye bye. Out of the winter chill, I head inside to the warmth of the Great Hall to meet Rockingham's archivist, Basil Morgan, who has kindly looked out for some fascinating documents from the time when Lady Faith Montague and Sir Michael Cum Seymour lived here in the mid-20th century. So Basil, how long have you been the archivist here at Rockingham? Next year, it'll be 30 years. 30 years. Not all as archivist. It's half of that as a guide, but most of the time as archivist. Most of the time. And has it been just fascinating over the past 30 years what you've, what you've uncovered? Absolutely, yes. Because being an historian anyway, I used to teach it up in school. Right. So the whole history side interests me a lot, yes. With Michael Cum Seymour, did he keep a lot of his correspondence, his letters, journals, um, as well as Lady Faith? Very much so, yes, he did. Um, she wrote to him, she was a regular uh, correspondent. Her husband, the fourth um, baronet, she wrote to him all the way through the war, virtually daily, whether he was up in the Orkney Islands or whether he was at the Battle of Jutland mm -hmm. or out in the, the Black Sea rescuing Tsarist. They were incredibly correspondent. And he somehow managed to get letters back virtually every day to her. That's incredible. Heaven knows how the system works. Yeah, no, no, exactly, but um, it worked. And then with Faith, were you able to uncover some of her letters? Because they were married in 1947, is that right? I think it was, yes, just after he came out of the yes, Navy. Exactly, yes, exactly, exactly. The interesting thing about Faith is her connection with the novelist E.M. Forster. I've read that, yes. Who was a, a, a very big novelist or before 1914, really, most of his novels, and they were about the Edwardian upper class, casting a fairly cynical eye over them. And we got a lot of letters, about 70 altogether, that Forster wrote to Lady Faith. It started off when she had written a short story, and Forster was a great pal of her father's. So he said, well, send it to Forster. I know Forster. And we've got a letter where she, he writes back saying uh, what it's like as a short story, being quite gentle with her. Yes. And writing back and saying, well, it's a short story, so you've got to be pretty concise. You haven't got much space, you know. Right, And right. from that, a friendship base. Became, and, and he came and stayed here very often. Did he? he? Yes. He, he, um, he often came here to stay for Christmas. In the end, he was inviting himself. How? Can I please come for three How or four wonderful. days? Yes. So they really forged a friendship. They really did form a friendship, and yes. Can I touch these? Yes, by all means. In really? fact, I think, yes, that's the, the one you're looking at is the is first one. one. I can see you've numbered them. Yeah, the very first one Shit. commenting on her short story. How? It's just wonderful just to see his Absolutely. handwriting his, here. His writing is, is fairly readable. Yeah, it is fairly readable. And then his signature here. Um, yes, I should like to come to Rockingham 
and to see you and Sir Michael. It is very kind of you to suggest it. Sure. How brilliant. And this went on until, um, well, I think he died in 1970. It was, it was, it was very, very lengthy. Certainly, that's part of 15 years. How brilliant. He hmm. says here, could I come on uh, the 25th for a couple of nights? <laughs> so yes, he really did invite himself by the end. <laughs> I generally spend Christmas, um, it sounds like, by itself um, in, um, in, in Buckingham. But he's asking if, if he could come. And he always left something behind. He always has to write a letter, or she has to write a letter saying, we found your pen you left behind. Or we found your, he always seems to have left something behind. Whether this was hoping he could pick it up the next How? time, or the next, I don't know. Oh, this is so brilliant. And then what do we have here? Well, that's something I just found, or I just noticed, uh, an impression of Forster by Lady Faith herself. I, I'm just reading a little bit because I've, the thing that comes out is Hinchingbrook is, it was the family seat. Mm. So um, that's where the first Earl of Sandwich lived up until my husband's grandfather, uh, so that would be Faith's brother, uh, sold it in 19, oh, really? uh, he sold it in 1955 and then bought Mapperton, which is where we are now, another historic house in Dorset in 1956. But Faith lived at Hinchingbrook, which is, you know, uh, 15 minutes from here, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. really quite close. So anytime I read anything or spot anything with Hinchingbrook, I'm really, of course, interested. And I just, um, if I, if you don't mind, if I could just read sure, something that yeah. I've just um, spotted. Our family home, Hinchingbrook, was only 15 miles from Cambridge, where Forster, a fellow of King's College, Cambridge, had rooms and was now living. He and my father were old friends, but had not met for some years. We drove through the great Gothic main archway and pulled up at the front door. During the war, Hinchingbrook was a hospital. And after the war, my brother, to whom the estate had been transferred, that would be Hinch, my husband's grandfather, found himself forced, partly for economic reasons and much to his regret, to sell the property. I'm gonna get quite emotional here. Um, Anyway, because it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you just, it's the family home and then you, I, you just found this and you read this. Um, and in 1962, the Huntington County Council bought the house for a comprehensive school. But in December 1955, that's when he sold it, the great house was empty and deserted. Before entering the house, I took Forster onto the terrace where Charles I and Oliver Cromwell once fought as boys. We stood on the terrace steps and admired the great semicircular bow window, the royal arms and initials ER on it in honor of Queen Elizabeth's visit in 1564. We then wandered across the lawn to see the medieval nunnery and from there into the main house. It was dark and lonely, but beautiful. Every room shuddered and we looked at the furniture and pictures by electric light. Some of the furniture had been taken away, but most of the family portraits the Hogarth, the Lelys, and the Van Dykes still hung on the walls. Our tour took an hour and Forrester had not said a word. Then he rounded on me explosively. To abandon it like that, to leave it empty, just to clear it out. What will happen to all its art treasures? He was desperately concerned. Houses are important, you know. A house gives security. It's an anchorage. And then she says, I was seeing a new Forrester. For a second, I had a glimpse of his real identity underneath. And late that night, I wrote in my diary, the shade of Mrs. Wilcox, Howard's End. To her family, it was only a house, but to her, it had been a spirit for which she sought a spiritual heir. I have to, I'm so glad you found this copy because I will immediately have to send this to right. my father-in-law who grew up at Hinchingbrook. So Hinch's um, son is my father-in-law, the 11th Earl of Sandwich, and he grew up in Hinchingbrook. And I think, I think these few paragraphs here really do sum up how I think we feel as a family, the sadness around losing Hinchingbrook House. But I, anyway, uh, Basil, I just wanna thank you so much. This has, I think, made my day. Good. I'm actually, 
I, I, I mean, I'm going to be just thinking about this the rest of the day, but this I is... literally found I... that 10 minutes ago. <laughs> it's catalogued, but I was looking through the four to five for the letters. Right. And suddenly found that, and I thought, is that by right. Lady Faith? And it's signed by Lady Faith. Yeah. Incredible. So thank you, thank you. Not at all. I really hope you're enjoying watching these episodes of American Viscountess, because I've been having so much fun making them. But we need your help, as we rely entirely on the support of our patrons to cover the cost of production. So please join our American Viscountess team by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash American Viscountess. Here, you'll get early access to all the episodes, behind the scenes content, and extra benefits too. I really look forward to seeing you there. It's really hard for me to articulate the emotion that I felt today when I sat with Basil and we were looking through some of the letters that Forster had written to Faith. Of course, I have this huge interest in Faith and learning a little bit more about her because she was the daughter of Alberta Sturgis, the ninth Countess of Sandwich, who was an American like me and married into the Montague family. There was a whole range of emotions that overcame me when I started to read her memories of really the first time that she met Forrester and she brought him to an empty Hinchingbrook. Of course, that's my last name, Viscountess Hinchingbrook. And when I started to read really the sadness around that and the regret of having had to sell Hinchingbrook for economic reasons and there was a real sadness that I felt and I was overcome by emotion, but I'm so happy that Basil was actually able to find that. But for me, it was a sense of sadness and a sense of really remembrance of how these historic houses um, uh, went through so much over the last century. Some survived and some were able to stay in the family, like Rockingham Castle, and some weren't, like Hinchingbrook. And they were either demolished or, like Hinchingbrook, made into a school. It was just wonderful to be able to read that account. And coming soon, I'll be visiting Hinchingbrook with my father-in-law, the Earl of Sandwich, to hear his memories of living there as a child and to explore the house now. It's believed there's been a church on this site at Rockingham since the 13th century. But after the destruction of the English Civil War, in 1650, it was rebuilt. And just as with the castle itself, each generation has added to it since. There's something quite wonderful and really magical about coming into a church, but in particular this church. This is the parish church of Rockingham Castle, and it lies just beyond the castle walls. It was a lovely walk to come here, but I am here for a purpose, and that is to find the memorial that was made and created for Michael and Faith and their three young sons who didn't make it. So I'm here searching that out right now. All around the side chapel are the most beautiful sculptures, but some were pieced together following the Civil War when it's thought Sir Lewis Watson brought together fragments of the memorial to his grandmother, Dorothy Montague, with that of his father, Sir Edward Watson. Oh, here we go, wow. There, right away. And here it reads, remember Michael Clem Seymour, 1909 to 1999, and his wife, Faith Montague, 1911 to 1983. There are three baby boys. The care they took of Rockingham and the happiness they found there and at Witherston. Now, Witherston is a part of Mapperton, so there still is land that we have 
that is part of Metford in the stage that is called Witherston. And, um, and uh, the people who live at Witherston now, the house that Michael and Faith were at, are, are friends of ours. And the many friends whose lives they touched. And what I really love here is that Faith is memorialized here alongside her husband, Michael, but also she's memorialized here next to actually one of her relations. So it's extraordinary to see that Lewis created this monument for his grandmother, Dorothy Montague, and his father, Edward Watson, side by side together, using the remains of other family, family monuments that had been destroyed by the parliamentarians. And, but it's just lovely for me to see that there are two Montagues here memorialized in the Watson uh, sort of family vault, if you like. Next time on American Viscountess, James tells me of family connections with one of the 19th century greats of British literature. Right away, as soon as I saw that, I thought, there must be a story about Charles Dickens here. It's, <laughs> the dear old Rockingham days are always fresh in my heart, believe me, ever faithfully yours, Charles Dickens. And that was written two months before he died. It's it, it, incredible. That, that relationship went on long after Richard Watson's death, and they were very close friends. We are so proud at Rockingham to have that association with one of England's, Britain's greatest writers. And to celebrate the year of Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee, and the 950th anniversary of Rockingham Castle, James and I plant a tree together. Now I'll get Gary to come and sort it out. He'll probably dig it out and do it again. That's what he did last time. <laughs> you We've are a star. It. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank you, James. You planted my 31st tree. And Thank I'm going to remember so this day forever. Ah, <laughs> brilliant.